Welcome to Hopscotch, Latin American Literature in Translation. And today uh, I'm delighted to have uh, with me Hordana Blechmar, who is from the University of Liverpool, an expert on contemporary Latin American, uh, Argentine, uh, literary, also visual and other forms of uh, culture. So Hordana, thank you so much uh, for being willing to give your time uh, and expertise. We're going to talk about this book, Samantha Schweblin's uh, Fever Dream, in Spanish, originally Distancia de Rescate. And my first question is just, how would you suggest uh, approaching this book? Thank you, John, for inviting me. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and um, it's it's great to talk about this novel. So, uh, as you know, it's a, it's a very short one. I have the, the Spanish version here. Uh, or the original um, version. Um, it's a short novel or novel, really, because it's quite, you know, it, it's 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 quite short. Um, and this is not surprising because Samantha Schwebeling is actually known for being a, a short story um, writer. She she has written uh, short short stories collections uh, before she published uh, this book, this novel. That it 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 was actually or it is uh, her first novel and she has another novel Kentucky that also um that it's quite it's it's longer but this one is kind of between a novel and a and a short story if you want um so in response to your question i think that's the first problem that we have with the novel or the novel because there are very different ways to approach it um you can read it as a ghost story you can read it as a as a terror psychological thriller you can read it as a story of motherhood of different types of motherhood uh, as a terror tale, as a dystopian story. You can read it as a, as a story about the environmental crisis. Um, you can read it as a, as a story about contagion. And this is quite interesting because it, it has been, it was written before COVID, of course. Um, and, and so now, you know, reading it now with everything that we have been through, particularly our experiences, you know, in, in lockdown and the claustrophobic, uh, you know, um, atmospheres that we all kind of experienced firsthand after COVID. It's quite interesting to read the novel now because it creates that atmosphere in relation to a different type of contagion. Um, and the novel, you know, at the towards the end, uh, Samantha Schwebelin talks about um, a still plague. Uh, that's kind of one of the, I think that the last uh, sentence, she she talks about plaga immobile. Um, so it's a kind of plague. It's a kind of, you know, epidemic. She's talking about, uh, obviously, you know, transgenic uh, soils and, and uh, uh, you know, the agrochemical um, traits and, you know, what that does, what those toxins um, and to toxic uh, um, uh, liquids do to kind of to, to humans and animals and the, and the na nature in general. Uh, but, it, but it also, I think, resonates with everything that we have been through during the pandemic in a way. So again, in, in, uh, in response to your question, depending on, on which of these uh, lines of arguments or which of these genres you decide to uh, kind of you know, follow, it has a different um, proposition, I think, the novel. Um, so if you, if you talk about, and, and obviously the, the more interesting thing is to put all these genres in dialogue and to 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 approach it as a as a novel that is all of those things at the same time not just one one uh, genre um so to me one of the most interesting things about the novel is the the way in which it talks about uh, what um rob nixon calls slow violence slow violence is that kind of violence that it's produced mainly by climate change and by you know deforestation and the, the environmental aftermath of, of wars um that it's kind of gradual and, and invisible so um I, that's that has been the main interpretation and the, the main way in which this novel has been read as a novel about you know slow violence and the ways in which um the current crisis cl climate crisis is affecting bodies without us even knowing, or even you know, with with an agent or with a with a perpetrator that we cannot see, with that gradually you know kills us, um, but that we cannot fight because we that we cannot see. And it's quite interesting that in the novel, the very agent of um, of uh, the uh, intoxication in the case of 
David uh, and um, and Nina and uh, Amanda is um, is water that that main st that thing that we cannot live without. So it's something that you know there is no escape. Um, so uh, so so that you know that's quite interesting. But again, to me, one of the most interesting things about the novel is the way that Samantha Swiveling addresses that issue, the uh, and, and that you know the issue of uh, um, uh, slow violence, both thematically and formally, how she constructs suspense mm -hmm. uh, with um, with with certain literary devices uh, that are you know that are kind of quite quite cunning and quite quite uh, quite clever the way that she uses for instance um silence ellipses euphemisms um to talk about something that again something that it's invisible absent that we cannot name but it's there she says she refers to the um you know the the, the toxins um and the poison in the in the bodies as gusanos mm -hmm. what she talks uh, obviously the uh, she talks about uh, the dew, um, rocio, you know, that thing that we, that kind of, it's water, but it's not water really, it's it's a contaminated um, type of liquid. Uh, they, David and um, Amanda, or David mainly talks about lo importante, you know, lo importante, mm -hmm. the important thing that, you know, both him and Amanda needs to kind of find out in this dialogue that they have, um it's again an euphemism about what what it, what is the important thing. We don't know exactly what it is, and and slowly again, like slow violence, we kind of find out what is it that uh, they are referring to. So I think that creates a rhythm that, in a way, is, is um, you know, it's it's it kind of it dialogues with 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 the the theme of the novel, a truth that de develops slowly. A little bit like you know the iceberg theory. There, in the novel, everything that it has that is not said is as important as what we read. Um, there, there's lots. There's so much here, and, and uh, we're gonna, I hope, unpack at, at least some of it in in the next uh, few minutes. I wanted to go back to one thing you talked about the um, the last words of the of the novel. I just I've got the translation here, which actually doesn't seem in some ways as as helpful in the translation it's motionless scourge and you said it was plaga immobil or something plaga immobil. yeah but motionless scourge is not quite the same but but it makes me think about this question of of motion mm -hmm. and and space as well mm -hmm. and, and maybe this is a way also to ask you to think about the uh this book in a sort of argentine context because what we have here amongst other things is well, we have uh, Amanda and Nina and her family. They're coming from the city to the countryside, right? And then you've and then they're, they're coming for a holiday, but then they they never leave, or we assume that they never leave at, at the end. And uh, then they interact with this small town in the in the middle of the the soy fields. Uh, perhaps it might be helpful to to talk a little about that sort of sense of of, of space and the relationship, perhaps the city and the countryside. Um, because there is a, there's a whole tradition there, isn't there? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's not any space, it's not any countryside. It's the Pampas, uh, which is this kind of vast extension of um, you know of land uh, that we have in Argentina from the north that covers really a, a big part of the country from the north, from the you know Chaco to to the Patagonia. So it's a huge. But Pampa actually in Quechua means. Um, play uh, sanura like a plain, uh, plain land, um, and it's quite interesting because it's as you say. On the one hand, uh, you can think about you know, um, uh, so this this is this is not an empty space, and it's not just because it has been populated by cattle and cows first by you know the the first kind of uh, the, the Spaniards who came with you know to to you know. Um, Basically, to to walk the lands with cattle and, and and cows, and then afterwards, more recently, um, that have been replaced by you know soybean production. Not just because of that, but but also because it's full of um, imaginaries mm -hmm. uh, and and kind of imaginaries linked to the pampa produce 
used uh, by by literature as well. So that's that's quite interesting. So the Pampas have been um, a big presence in Argentine literature. Uh, obviously, Sarmiento's uh, Facundo has been read as the place of barbarism. It has been also been uh, discussed by English travelers as kind of the sublime Pampas. Uh, it has been, um, you know, also the, been uh, kind of um, described as the place, a place of escape from the city, from the urban cities, and the the the, the site of uh, modernization as well. So there has been a lot of different interpretations of, you know, what what are the Pampas, you know, what what can we find there? It's not an empty space, and the fact that she, Evelyn, chooses this particular space to locate the novel is not, uh, you know, it's it's not by chance. She she knows obviously um, about you know about this, and it's quite interesting that that the two cup that like the the two kind of families that moved to the Pampas are white women. I mean, they they are composed by white women, um, the uh, Amanda and um, and Carla, that do not belong to the Pampas. So they are also kind of you know strangers, if you want. Um, there and um, at what I think uh, Amanda refers to Carla as a, a kind of a sophisticated woman, even in the novel. Um, and so the, the, this kind of imagine is about uh, the, the 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 city, La Ciudad y el Campo, the city and 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 the campus. It's already you know they are again it's implicit, but it's in, in the novel as well. And one one of the interesting thing about I think uh, how Schwebelin, um Construct, constructs uh, this space is um, that she manages to talk about this vast extent field that is now again, uh, you know, um, dominated by the capital and by you know soybean productions and by this kind of you know really dangerous um, you know to, um, kind of agri agrochemicals, um, but she manages to present that landscape as a very claustrophobic space mm -hmm. very kind of, we we feel very even though it's a vast and open uh site we feel as claustrophobic and as you know enclosed as amanda is in the in the novel it's quite interesting when you read the the dialogue between amanda and and david you don't you don't know quite sure where she is um in the beginning I, you know, in the beginning, I, I thought she was maybe, you know, buried alive somewhere because she talks a lot like if she's, you know, still somewhere. Um, Lucia Di Leone, who has written uh, a review about the novel, talks about, uh, refers to, to the dialogue as a confession or uh, a psychoanalytic um, analysis. And so you, you, you could kind of compare you know, you could can you could imagine that they are in in this kind of you know place where confession take take place and uh, you know in close, or it could be an inter in, interrogat uh, interrogatory interrogation place as well. So um, so there is the the way in which she constructs this spatial sensation, claustrophobic, uh, you know, quite without air. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think it's quite clever. Uh, and, and how that is opposed to the supposed openness to to the pampas. Um, the more we talk about it, the more I think it's, this is a really great book, actually. But that's um, we'll put that to, to one side for a moment. So, uh, just picking up on on what you were saying there. So you've got this combination on on different levels of uh, on the one hand, yeah, the space, the space of the pampas, the pa pampas imagined in, in those terms, right? Of of a sort of endless, limitless. Um, Possibility too, danger, but possibility at the same time, and, and but also you've got these broad global processes, right? Such as um, agro industry and 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 soy and mechanization and so on. And on the other hand, you've got this intimacy. You've got the intimacy of the relationship between uh, Amanda and and David, as, as you say. I, I love this idea. We, we could talk about that more about but confession, interrogation, right? He's whispering in her ear and so mm -hmm. on. And also you've got the family, right? So this is this is a story also about a, a family or two families, uh, perhaps, and an interest in in family roles, in mothers and, and motherhoods and so on. So 
I, I wonder if we could talk about either end of that scale, either those those br those really broad themes that she's trying to talk about, the slow violence, the iceberg, and so on of of uh, of, of gl global hyper modernity or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and also the intimacy of relationships between mothers and daughters, mothers and sons, and and mothers and mothers as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing that um that we should also uh, also clarify is that they are actually in the. Um, um, I mean, we talk about this, you know, interrogation, confession, but they are also they are actually in the um, in the in the small room of a of a rural hospital, right? And and that's where the actual the dialogue takes place because, as we know, Amanda is you know is sick; she's going to die. That's also quite clever how we know that there is a sort of punctum in the novel that we know that she's going to to die, a literary punctum, if you want, right? She, we know that she's going to die. She knows, they know that they <laughs> that she's going to die, but they still need to kind of, you know, uh, get to, to, to that, to, to that, to, to reveal what that important thing is. Um, and, um, and yes, so, so like like you said, I think the the two kind of maybe big th themes of the novels is one the you know the, the slow violence and uh, the issue with uh, it's a very current issue as well uh, or current um, there are lots of discussions about the the agency of non uh, human things um, new materialisms what Jane Bennett calls vibrant matter no the, mm -hmm. the the fact that you know not just humans uh, have vitality and are agents but also kind of non-human entities nature but also things you know objects it, that's quite interesting because she 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 was writing about that a little bit like at the same time maybe that these books were you know being written new materialism is is, is quite i mean it's not that old as a as a trend, if you want, mm -hmm. so there have been, you know, obviously discussions about the non-agency, the agency of non-human things, um, for 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 longer than than uh, kind of what we see now. But, um, but but it's quite interesting that the way that she talks about again, the the agency of, for instance, the field del campo that kills. No, she says el campo mata. Um, it's uh, uh, and 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 the uh, in a way the novel denounces that you know the current emergency that we live now the climate emergency is partly because we haven't been able to um understand that you know that uh that non-human bodies have also agency mm -hmm. um, as well but also like you said it could be read as a novel about motherhoods and relationships also between women uh, as well uh, quite like kind of a, from a feminist perspective as well uh, you know from a kind of uh, gender perspective as, as well you can you can read this novel i think it's quite interesting that this novel dialogues with, with other novels um and other writers mainly female writers in argentina that have been writing about uh, non-idealistic, non-romantic um, ideas of motherhood. I'm t thinking of Ariana Arwick's mainly. Um, mm -hmm. uh, her books are, you know, precisely about that. And she also talks about a rural, very unsettling setting. Although she's, because she lives in France, she she kind of her imaginary is more France, but also dialogues with kind of the imaginaries of the Pampas. Uh, I'm talking about Leila Sukari. Uh, Leila Sukari has a, a book called Fugaz that starts the first sentence of that book is about a mother who feels disgust by the birth of her child. I'm talking about uh, Lucila Grossman has a book, uh, and these are all yet very young uh, writers as well, that uh, is called uh, Mapas Terminales, and she gives a birth to a sort of cyborg that is kind of an alien. So I think it's, you know, it's quite interesting how uh, Distancia de Rescate dialogues with ideas of motherhood, very kind of non-romantic um, uh, ideas of motherhood. And one interesting thing about the novel as well, that, as you know, has been adapted to a film version uh, by Claudia Sosa and uh, Schoebelin, who has co-written the script, is that um, Dolores Fonsi, the actress who plays the character of Carla, has now um, directed her first film 
called Blondie that it's getting a lot of attention in Argentina. I haven't seen it yet, but it's also about a mother and a son, uh, a non kind of non traditional mother and a son. I would, you know, uh, recommend to watch that film because apparently it's also quite interesting. They also don't refer to each other as mom or son like it happens in the novel but in this case it's quite a, a kind of a tender apparently because i haven't seen it as i said but apparently it's a, a tender story of motherhood but there are some similarities between the the novel and, and this film in particular and the the film of this novel is on netflix so it is at the moment so um it's fairly easy to 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 get hold of so f continuing on with this idea and we were talking about this a little bit earlier before we uh, started recording this chat um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the idea of monstrosity. So, mm -hmm. so we, you were saying we were talking earlier about that. The, there's the whole question of the, these monstrous children, right? These sort of de physically uh, deformed children. Apparently, uh, David David is 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 one of them, right? They 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 see others when they go out of the shops and so on. Although they're kind of at the margins, they're not to be seen. Yeah. They're meant to be kept out of of sight. But you were also talking earlier on again about a sort of monstrous motherhood or, or that notion, right? And not just non-traditional, but but maybe and and that, that there's that sense of guilt and as well mm -hmm. in in in, in, in a, Amanda and and maybe Carla we we have less sense of you know did I do something wrong? Is it my fault? You know this the Spanish title distancia de rescate. I should have been there for you know I should have been there for my child. Is my you know that the the blame is somehow internalized. So, I, yes, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about these various levels of monstrosity and maybe, yes, blame and shame and so on. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there are, there are two kind of, um, yeah, like you said, I mean, there are monsters everywhere because the animals are also mon monstrous in the in the film. You have dogs, uh, dogs without a le legs, or so dogs that, again, are because they've been all contaminated, horses that, you know, gone crazy and... Um, but in, in the case of the children, um, of the monstrous children, I think it's quite interesting because, you know, Carla refers to her, um, to her son, to David, as a, a monster. He, she says, you know, David, this is not my child, first of mm -hmm. all, this is a monstrous. Uh, as, as we know, you know, he has been cont contaminated. He, he's been taken to the curandera, you know, this kind of... Um, person in the pampas who basically um, migrates the, his soul to a different body and then becomes a different David. David, at the time of the, um, when the, the story takes place, is I think nine years old. Um, but this happened, you know, when, when he was three years old. So he's, he's, he's an alien. He's someone who she doesn't recognize as a son. But obviously we can't read that topic of the monstrous child um, or we can find it in different novels. Uh, not just novels, uh, but also films. I'm thinking, for instance, about um, uh, you know Albertina Carri's films, um, where the children are, are cruel. She has a, a film, La Rabia. I don't know if you, if you've seen it. It's about a child who is also kind of a you know very unsettling <laughs> type of child in in the in the rural settings. Because in Albertina Carri, the field, El Campo, is always both a place of comfort, but also a place of um, you know the wild and 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 you know things happen there that, that are kind of quite unsettling. But I'm also thinking about Mariana Enrique's stories. Particularly, there is a book called uh, Chicos Que Vuelven, which has quite a lot of connection with this with this book because it's about children. Obviously, Mariana Enriquez is an Argentine writer again, one of the most uh, kind of I guess popular writers now particularly in the genre of horror uh, in Argentina. And, and in this particular book, she talks about children who have disappeared and then return at some point to their family houses. Mm -hmm. And they, they are of the same age that they have when they disappeared. And apparently nothing happened to them. You know, they are okay, but they are, there is something very uncanny, very, very kind of monstrous about these children, the parents do not recognize the children and we don't know exactly what happened and this creates a very unsettling atmosphere very similar to what happens in Samantha Schoeling so there is something very kind of uh, similar here to all these children that basically question the idea that childhood is you know this pure innocent um, you know uh, kind of age where 
uh, and very transparent as well. That, you know, and, and I think what what is very interesting in in this novel is that it speaks to to mothers and also fathers as well, parents in general who. You know, I think we all at some point <laughs> have looked at our children <laughs> and thought, you know, who, who is this monstrous child? <laughs> you know, they, they they are not, you know, they and and feel that strength, that feeling of strangement. So I think that that's quite interesting. It's not something that it's um, it's unrelated to everyday experience. We I think that's the unsettling, you know, aspect of the novel that it's not something about you know fantasy, but it's it's a very kind of you know, realist <laughs> feeling. <laughs> no, I, I was thinking when you were talking uh, again about the many different levels or ways or in which you can approach this book. On the one hand, I mean, even th some of the terms you were using, the notion about the children who return and disappeared. Um, you know, we could think about that perhaps in, in in terms of recent Argentine history and the you know the the children and grandchildren. Of, of of the of the dis or the children that disappeared who sort of return and 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 are the same and not the same. There's a whole Argentine context of that, but it's also I was also thinking again much more generically how much in some ways this is like a fairy tale, right? And the ways in which fairy tales dig into some of those psychic you know anxieties, right? About childhood and adulthood and families uh, about things that we can't control about um about the souls right that whole question about the curandera and the transmigration of souls there's there, there, yeah. there, there's a lot there yeah i mean that's that's quite interesting because i think you could you could actually read the novel if you want in a completely different direction and think about it as a you know as um una fábula, uh, like a fable that um, kind of uh, about about guilt, as you say, like, you know, if you don't, if you're not a good mother and don't look after your children and don't kind of, you know, uh, risk, you know, that if, if you if you break that kind of thread that that they talk about between children and, and mother, then this is what is going to happen to you. Like if you're not, so it's it's quite interesting because you could read it in, in that direction as well as, you know, with the moraleja, you know, mm -hmm. like this is what, so, but obviously I don't think she, she, she meant it to be that kind of story, but there is something about, um, about what is, you know, what about the, the fantasy that we all mothers and fathers again have about what, could happen if we don't if we don't keep our ch children you know next to us close to us um and 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 the, you know there was fear <laughs> of every parent that they you know that they you know they well this is this is not even the worst nightmare i think it's worse than the worst nightmare what happened to 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 david and 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 nina but uh, it's quite interesting yeah that that she i think plays with with those fears so and, then, and talking about fears, and, and this is, I think, where, where we perhaps have to end as a, as a last question. But again, earlier on, we were talking about um, the uncanny, the weird, the strange, uh, alien, alienation. Um, and, and you were talking, uh, again, before we started uh, recording, I wonder if you could say a little about this, about uh, uh, the way, the difference between the weird and the eerie and an absence Mm -hmm. And also in relationship to uh, the use of language and landscape, I think. I wonder if you could you could just say a little bit more about that as a sort of final yeah. comments. Well, yes, because I, I mean, you know, when I was reading um, the novel, I, you know, I, I thought, okay, the, the kind of why is it so disturbing? Why is it so, you know, what is it? Um, what's so terrifying about this novel, and and how how she managed to to construct these kind of feelings, and and I was you know at the same time reading a book by Mark Fisher called The Weird and the and the Yuri with here, and I, it's quite <laughs> uncanny <laughs> again, as well as um, how how the book speaks to 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 Samantha Schubling's novel. Uh, Fisher basically makes. Um, a difference here between the weird and the and the eerie, and and he says, okay, both the the weird uh, and the ears are preoccupied with with the strange, 
right, with the issue of the strange. But there is a difference between the weird and the eerie in the sense that the weird is for him that which does not belong and is constituted by by a presence, a presence of something that doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. and, and he talks, for instance, about montage, montage as the kind of aesthetic form of the weird. And then he says the, the eerie is something different. The eerie, he says, is the failure of a presence. And he says that the eerie is either when there is something there that should not be there, or when there is nothing present when there should be something. So if we think about the Pampas, for instance, and you know, there's something, and, and, and he talks specifically about uh, emptied landscapes, where the eerie is. Uh, when you know there is nothing there, but we we know that there is something there. Obviously, the you know the kind of all this poison that we know it's there, but mm -hmm. shouldn't be there in the pampas, uh, creates that eerie atmosphere because it's everywhere, and yet we do not see it. So she, you know, it's it's very eerie, um, and and it's something quite interesting what he says also about the capital. So he talks sp specifically about how. Um, the eerie is related to the scandal of, of capital um, and how basically the agency of capital um, is related to that sensation of, you know, it's everywhere, we don't see it, but it's still doing something and this, this basically destroying everything uh, and creating kind of this eerie atmos atmosphere. And we, we see it very, very, very kind of clearly in what the capital and, and soybean production uh, and global, you know, uh, production and, and glyphosate in particular and agro-businesses are, are producing in the landscape. All this is, and, and that's why we can, I think we can um, read this novel as a political novel as well. How she basically, through the, you know, the um, creation of this eerie atmosphere um, and and this, this references to the, to the agency of capital because Fisher says, that the eerie is related to the questions of, of uh, agency, what kind of agent is acting here. And the eerie, if you want, um, the, the eerie uh, is produced by this lack of knowledge, the unknown, the lack of knowledge. We don't know what, you know, what, what is who or what is producing this atmosphere or who is producing this disturbing feeling. So he, he talks a lot about uh, the, the agent, of the eerie. So I think she actually, without, I don't know if she read <laughs> Fisher or not, but I think it's quite interesting how how she creates this eerie atmosphere to, in a way, make a political statement about, um, you know, the, the current kind of climate crisis and um, uh, what is producing to us, to everyone, non-human and human bodies um, today. Well, that, I think, is uh, the perfect point at which to end. We could continue, I know, much, much longer. You've really uh, opened up many of the ways in which we can think about uh, this novel for such a short novel, as you said at the beginning. It there's a lot in it, but there's also a lot not in it. That's uh, the, the, Those silences are gestures towards things that are off stage, and it makes us uh, think about what is not present and what should be present and, and so on. Hodana, thank you so much uh, for your time and, and generosity uh, to talk uh, about this novel. This has been a, a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm.